Well, hello everybody. Welcome to Hewell's Gold, episode 34. I'm Chris. And I'm Alan. We didn't we didn't go very far from last week to this week. No, we no. Like what? <laughs> Three quarters of a mile? <laughs> How long is the ferry ride? I don't know, because it's definitely the same ferry ride that he was on when he went under the bridge. Like for sure. It's the same boat color. Okay. He's wearing the same thing. I think he there I I was watching this and they did a lot of double duty from last week mm. to this week. Mm-hmm. The helicopter, the boat ride, the clothing, everything. It's it's definitely a same set of two days. But Angel Island, did you know this existed before I'm last go week? Go with go with a negative on that one. <laughs> I've seen this episode before like last year, so I knew it existed, but it definitely didn't before that. Even though living in San Francisco, I would look out and see it. I don't know. Yeah, it's not promoted very well. I mean, no. just in for the general public. And you'll hear so about people, that from Huel and old Ranger old, Dan. Old Big Dan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because we lived in that area for, not, well, we lived in. The Bay Area. The Bay Area. Yeah. Not in San Francisco. But, uh, yeah, I had no. We knew Alcatraz was there. Who doesn't, you know? The Rock. <laughs> That's what Treasure Dan's Island's in. there. Uh, There's a flea market. I didn't Every know year. that that was a fake island. Mm-hmm. You did? Yeah. Whatever. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, before no. we get started, I wanted to talk about the big Huel news that's going on. We recorded a couple episodes earlier and didn't mention this because we recorded them way earlier. And there's a Kickstarter happening that... Kind of coincided with that uh, Huel Marathon last month. And it's about digitizing specific Huel episodes for viewing on streaming platforms. Uh, Apple TVs, Roku's, through Amazon and all this stuff. Now, we instantly saw this and thought, great, cool, good job KCET, because they're the ones behind this. But I had some questions because, as we all know from listening to this show, all the episodes are already digitized, like almost everything, everything that Huel ever did. So why do they need this money? So we emailed KCET, and we talked to like four different people, finally got some answers to the questions. And Ariel Carpenter, who is the, what's her title, Vice President of Communications, Okay. emailed us back and said that because the digital consumption platforms work with different file types, they have to basically digitize them from the raw tapes for each platform. And what Chapman did doesn't work with those platforms, different file format. Hmm. So... KCET is working on episodes of visiting, mostly, it looks like, because they own partial rights to those. Because KCET and Huel Hauser jointly created visiting. Huel owned the rights to California's Gold and a lot of his other shows outright. When he died, he left at the Chapman. They now are in the rights holder place that Huel was in. So, Chapman is working with KCET in this. It's a joint venture as far as the rights go. So, if you're wanting to watch Huel on your TV instead of your computer, you should be all up in this. And you said it's primarily visiting. That's that's more my... uh, That's what you're getting from it? That's what I'm getting from what she was saying, because I know that KCET doesn't own the rights to California's Gold. At all. So, why? That's probably why they're starting with the visiting, right? Yeah, I think so. So, really, this is this is crowdfunding, digitizing visiting. Mm-hmm. If that's the case, unless Chapman wants to work with them to. Well, I asked them if this was like the uh, end of this or just the beginning, and she said this is just the beginning. Like they're going to continue with this process. They're just trying to get an initial batch of episodes that 
they haven't had digitized in any way to play even on TV mm. up until now. Now we know as Chapman, uh, what's the archive? The Chapman archive viewers that we can watch them there, but that's not always the most convenient. That's not how people watch TV. No, not an embedded video. No. <laughs> <laughs> so this Kickstarter campaign, as most do, have some cool uh, pri- prizes or the gifts. What do they call these? I'm going to... Well, yeah, it's not really a prize. No, you're not, not winning. winning anything. Hey, it's, it's a gift. It's more of a... Yeah, it's a gift. Yeah. But there's Huel Face fans, like little Paddle Your Face fans, enamel pins, t-shirts. They're referring to it as a reward. Reward, okay. There you go. There you go. There is... T-shirts, both white and tie-dye. I'm into that tie-dye shirt. I don't know why. You're into it? I'm I'm wanting to be into it, like inside of it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, what else we got? We got a postcard. You don't like the tie-dye? No. All right. I guess <laughs> That's you don't. Cool. I mean, but I you know don't a lot of people ha- that do. You don't necessarily like. I like just like the off-white shirt. Hang loose. Yeah. Yeah, I can tell from what you're wearing right now. I appreciate that. <laughs> Tote bags. Uh, signed books, signed Louis. Take a look at this books. We already got that. Thanks, Louis. But then the 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 piece de resistance, as Huel like to say in a lot of these shows, <laughs> is a dinner for two with Louis Forte himself. Now, as of today, it's we're we're recording this Saturday, August twenty fifth. There's six days left. There are still Louis dinners available. Get on it. It only costs six hundred and twenty five dollars, which sounds like a lot, but this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Unless you're Louie's wife. Yep. And then it's an everyday <laughs> opportunity. But we are at twenty thousand five hundred and twenty five dollars as of this recording, out of twenty five thousand dollar goal. So we're close, but we only have six days left. So if you're listening to this now, you have until what, Friday? To do this. Yeah. Get on it. <laughs> well, I guess, no, this will come out Sunday, so it's still Friday, though. That doesn't change. Yeah, Friday. <laughs> yep. Okay. Anyway, had to say all that, but the theme this week, what did you think? Enjoyed it. Yeah. I I originally said that, was it last? No, it was during the mariachi episode. Mm-hmm. That that was the most ethnic rendition. Yeah. This... This is a challenger. Yes, by far. I don't want to like play favoritism, but this one was v- even more unique because you don't hear this kind of music right very often. Now, one thing about it, you know, you just heard it and everything, but I suggest going and seeing this being played because there's a little funny things happening because everyone's kind of sitting at this park bench and there's Everyone seems to be in uh, normal stances, sitting or standing. The symbol guy's kneeling down yeah, for some reason. No, just purely on his knees. He also, okay, everyone is dressed either in some sort of like, uh, you know, kind of ethnic clothing. I don't know what to say. Traditional, I don't know. Traditional, that's the word I was looking for. And, or just kind of everyday stuff. But this guy, he's got like this vest on. He's giving me the vibe that he's an ethnomusicologist who's going and studying this kind of music. And he's like <laughs> trying to be involved with it. And he just gets to hit the cymbals. Yeah. Like, okay, Bill, uh, you're going to do the cymbals. Oh, that, thank you for letting me be a part of this because I, I, I'm just here to study, guys. I've always wanted to know. Well, Roy, <laughs> you're part of us now. Anyway, it was a good theme. But we're not here for themes. We're here for content. Nice. There's a lot of content. Nice. He'll tell us why we're here. They call it the jewel of San Francisco Bay. This beautiful island that's visible from the city on all but the foggiest days. Now, it's not nearly as well known as Alcatraz. In fact, it remains somewhat of a mystery even to many native San Franciscans, even though it's the largest island in the bay, a square mile. The place is rich in history starting with the fact that 3,000 years ago, several villages of the native coastal Miwok Indians were here. 
Back in 1775, Spanish explorers were here. And these days, it's a California State Park. Now, we were invited to visit the place and see for ourselves just what it had to offer. And pulling into the beautiful little harbor, we knew right away we were visiting a very special place. Okay, before we get on the island, mm -hmm. we have to talk about the boat. Which I think is the same boat from last week. Okay, I can see that. Mm -hmm. Did you notice? This is the first thing that I thought of when I saw Huel on the boat. Mm -hmm. You've seen the first Mighty Ducks, right? Many, many times. Doesn't he look like Coach Riley? Dude. <laughs> <laughs> so much so. It's so just the pop collar. She'd be chewing gum and he would be. Oh, man. Because he's got the same hair. Yeah. And, I mean, it's like if Coach uh, Riley was really serious. Or, or happy, I mean, because he was always serious. Oh, and he's even wearing the black jeans like he always put. <laughs> dude, this is your best one yet. Oh, dude. Okay. Well, you know, also on the boat, which I didn't really notice the, f the first time through, mm -hmm. but as I was watching it, did you notice that there was just a, a kid just four arms over yeah. the side of the boat, and Louie had to zoom in to get this kid out of the shot? Well, there's someone else. There's someone running in front of the camera. There's another kid to Huel's right, like, just being all excited. I mean, they are doing this on a public ferry. This is true. But I think what the reason that kid's even in it, I'm guessing it's the, shot, it's the kid. Looks like a kid. Mm -hmm. But Louie wanted to get a shot of the land behind yeah, Huel. of course. And he only get a little bit and then just end up zooming in, mm -hmm. not getting anything. But, but what we can do is when we get on the island, is see how Huel introduced himself to Dan? Yeah. Did you think this was a weird introduction? I mean, if you're talking about just people in general, yes. But with Huel, he's always kind of... what I don't know. What I, about it, exactly? Okay. He just walks up, shakes his hand in a relatively uninterested manner. <laughs> yeah. And then he starts making statements. Oh, like, about, uh, so this is yeah, the... Uh, well, this is, well, you know, this is where we check in, I guess. Yeah. It's such a... <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because there's a number of points in this episode specifically where Huel seems to be more of a, like, the amateur in the situation. Yeah. And I don't know what was going on if he was like, if they filmed this like a little while before he had all the experience that he had, like in the later episodes but he, I, well usually he's real excited to get off the boat this is why i i don't i think that was a staged introduction because his first yeah. step on land is typically wow mm -hmm. you're looking around but it's it sort of like he had a really frustrating ferry ride and he also mentions at the end of the episode that they were there for two days and do you think that maybe this was like either way into day one or even day two, and it was super staged? Maybe. No, you know, Dan, we didn't introduce you. We didn't introduce ourselves. All right, Louis, Let's... I'm just going to start walking, and then we'll we'll do it, because it is weird. <laughs> but luckily, Huel popped his collar down, so he's not He's not the... Uh, what was the name of the team? That, the right? Hawks. The Hawks, that's right. Gosh, <laughs> it's still messing me up. <laughs> I never thought of that. Anyway, where this intro happens is in Ayala Cove, which used to be called Hospital Cove. And Ranger Dan Winkleman is our kind of guide here. Mm -hmm. Did you find anything about him? I didn't look him up. Okay. Yeah. I, I thought to, too. But I feel like he'd be a, a prolific guy. Yeah. He just seems like that kind of person, so I, I should have. Oh, well. He, I like to, I really like his look because he never takes his sunglasses off. He's got like the big raincoat on. He's just got this specific look to him that I don't want to mess up for this yeah. episode. And he, well, he's just a tall dude. Yeah. Imposing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, he's talking about how this specific cove used to be where all the boats that came from, well, anywhere, would come and have to be quarantined. 
And he continues to talk about that. And Huell does one of his vintage. Now, what do you mean quarantine? And and Dan had to, you know, elaborate. And the, the weirdest part about it, because he talks about people coming with diseases and they had to be made well before they are allowed onto the mainland, but that there was a ship that was permanently out there called the Omaha that was like, they would use it as a fumigation Station? Station, yeah. <laughs> they would use the boilers because it was old boiler ship. And they would exterminate all the rats and vermin. But I was thinking, like, if they're using steam to do this, which doesn't have any sort of poisonous qualities, they're just... Just making them sweat? They're just burning <laughs> these rats? <laughs> <laughs> like, what is going on in these ships? That sounds so much more gross. Yeah. It, there was something that... I thought he would have brought up, but he didn't. This was basically the Ellis Island of the West Coast. Yeah. I mean, that's the easiest way to describe it, like quarantine. You have to, exactly, you know, yeah. I only know that because Kathleen's family, her great-grandpa was quarantined. <laughs> In the real Ellis Island? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I knew that so, happened there. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, that was the, the analog, West Coast analog. Yeah. Well, there was a perfect opportunity for that to happen. Because we're leaving Dan behind, we're meeting up with Paul Chow, who's another tour guide here. Mm-hmm. But we're cha- we're kind of changing vantage points because Paul, who is a Chinese guy, obviously he's going to have a different outlook on this place than Old Ranger Dan. And they're starting off at this big bell, and this is where Paul says that this was the Plymouth Rock for the West Coast, and like. Not really, Paul. <laughs> like that's a different thing. <laughs> it is the Ellis Island of the West Coast. Yeah, like totally. That would have been the, the the way to describe it. But oh well, I get his point. But Paul is talking about how this bell was a fog bell, but it also had some kind of negative psychological factors to it because of the situation that was going on there. Because this wasn't like necessarily a happy thing. All of these. Asian immigrants coming in is how he describes it. So hearing this bell would kind of remind them of how sad this was. Mm -hmm. He'll just goes, yeah. So this is the original bell, huh? Ding, ding, ding. And just starts (laughs) ringing it (laughs) with his nuts. Yeah. Like not thinking like, Oh, there's a lady who was here. Like, 10 feet behind me, me ringing this might not be nice to her. <laughs> Doesn't care. Oh, man. Yeah, there's... We need to make a montage of Huel just knocking on things. Okay. Like I've been saying, I've been going through all the episodes into the future so I could watch all of them to kind of, like, have context for everything. I finally finished. Like, I literally finished Friday. I've now watched every episode in order. Mm-hmm. One of the last ones is one of the more famous ones is the Bunny Museum. Have you seen this one? No. Okay. It's actually a visiting that they repurposed as a California's Gold. And do you know anything about it? Nope. Okay. I I don't want to give too much away because it's really funny and good. But We'll, we'll revisit this oh, yeah. six years in the exactly. future. And... But it's the ultimate. It's the absolute ultimate of Huel touching stuff because the lady has to keep telling him over and over. And then she starts like laugh, kind of like laugh screaming at him. Like, yo, you can't touch this. Ah, no one do this. If you come to the museum, don't do what Huel does. And he does. He still touches right after that. So this oh. is like a building up over the years of him doing these shows, touching things he's not supposed to. We got to make, we got to start here making notes. Make my, my favorite mm-hmm. is when he's at the Ch- the Chinese museum. And there's the first uh, dragon for the parade. Oh, made of like the paper mache. And she, and yeah, but it was the eyes were not a plastic, but they were something of a hard material. Mm-hmm. And he just gives it, turns his hand over, and just <laughs> gives it like the fingernails on the, yeah. the eyeball. <laughs> oh man. Anyway, this is a good one too, though. Just the the knocks. Oh yeah. But Paul is bringing us around to the main barracks, which is where. It, it, it wasn't even so much quarantine at this point. It was almost like 
forced uh, i don't want to like call it a prison necessarily but there it was a different time chinese specifically chinese immigration was outlawed from 1882 to 1924 it's called the exclusionary act and because of that most asian immigrants were not allowed into the u.s yeah and they would anyone who came to the u.s would be kind of well quarantined but not because of having diseases just because they were asian it was a racist thing that that was happening in california well that actually takes us back to when we did our episode on Locke. Yeah, and the only reason it was it was founded on that land is because Chinese, uh, I wouldn't say immigrants because some of them were second generation, right? Mm-hmm. They couldn't own land. Yeah, but the guy still let them build the city on it. Yeah. So, anyways, that was an example because there were already plenty of Asian people who had come even prior to California being a state. Yeah, all the railroad building. And then it had become a lot of like farm labor well, at that here, point. Even here, right? The Current Historical Society just put out uh, their last newsletter, and it was there was a, a Chinese American who helped uh, Thomas Baker reclaim land. Yeah, and then was given a lot of land. And then in Bakersfield, there was buying and selling of land. Chinese, uh, just not even Chinese Americans, just. Chinese were able to own land in defiance of the Exclusionary Act. And so here, there was just a whole uh, nullification of the of the law, which I thought was kind of interesting. It is. But that definitely wasn't happening here in no. Angel Island. Like this, when we get in the barracks, we go into the women's room, and it, it does straight up look like a jail. It does. Although, it was kind of weird talking to Lei King Wong. Yeah. One of uh, the, no, she was there. That's right. She yeah, was she really was young. on the tour, but then obviously they had talked to her prior, and she was actually there. As and a young she doesn't child. remember, which I thought was interesting. She doesn't remember the bunks. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of curious how they was there fewer people being housed at that time. Was it tapering off, or maybe this was at the height of it, or maybe she just kind of blocked that out. Yeah, maybe because this definitely does not seem like a favorable memory for a lot of people. No. You know, it was blocked out. Yeah. Good <laughs> segue. <laughs> Images of other people using the bathroom next to you. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, because that's where we are now. We're in the bathroom. Which, to me, this was the most interesting part. Very much so. Because uh, I guess what Paul was telling us is Chinese culture, the women are very modest. And so... It's not like women anywhere else are like loving... Right, right. Sitting on a toilet These around are just everyone. wide open toilets. Totally. Um, looking just like the troughs when I was in middle school. They made... Oh, yeah. I know the troughs. Yeah. And everyone just trying to cover up. Use the restroom. <laughs> this was... Let's talk... Wait. Okay. I I don't think a lot of people remember this. Maybe people like older than us do. But as guys... There's a lot of kind of open airness in bathrooms. Mm-hmm. Not always the funnest thing, but specifically those troughs that were like a everyone stand at a urinal. That it was basically like a bathtub bolted to the wall. Yes, and it's sort of they like you know what? You just decide how far you need to stand from someone. <laughs> I was sort if, there, of the... if there's going to be ten people, you can be touching shoulders. Yep. But if it's two, you can be at opposite ends. The place where it doesn't belong is for like ten to. Th- 12 year olds or like 11 no. to 13 year old no, boys no, 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 no. it's like the it's like, it's like a nightmare for them i don't remember where i was it was definitely in town i had to be i know this is a thing that would happen at bars it might be like still happening i don't go to bars that often what that there were still these troughs but they would fill it with ice what i don't know man we need to talk to some some bar going friends of ours well, d- so this is a question because this is the open airness of the toilet mm-hmm. that's relevant did your high school have doors on all of the stalls? Yeah, I think so. As far as I remember. No. You're still, you're still yeah, there was there were quite a few. <laughs> I mean, every once in a while there'd be one that was broken because some fool kicked it. No, I know specifically there were because I have a, a memory of ditching class and hiding in the stall for a whole period 
listening to uh, that third Weezer record that came out <laughs> in whatever year that was, the green one. Because it had just come out that day, and I had my little CD player with the anti-skip. Yeah, of course. And, and I just listened to that record like on repeat three times, sitting on the toilet with the door closed. So, yes. Okay. So, there are distinct memories of walking into my high schools, like during the football games. Mm-hmm. No doors. <sighs> right? And there was, which I'm guessing this was to be ADA compliant, mm-hmm. in the, the quad area where you get your food, you'd use the restroom there, there would be two toilets in one stall. (laughs) (laughs) That's for real? Yes. (laughs) Which I'm guessing they had to meet like a, you know, minimum space standard. So they'd say, ah, just box it around the other toilet too. That's so funny, man. (laughs) I want to go to your high school and check this out. I'm sure they fixed it since then. It's not like you graduated a long time ago or anything, but... Well, but we didn't talk about the the solution okay. that these people came up with. It's a genius. With. Yeah, yeah. Because you would think like, okay, we need to hang a, uh, curtains or we need to do something where we can't see each other. Mm-hmm. Well, there were bags, and they just popped. They were just the, put bags on on their heads so that you. It wasn't so much, oh, I'm covering myself up. It's covering up my head so that everyone else feels comfortable. But if everyone's doing it, everyone's comfortable. And apparently, he, oh, you know, as far as. Paul explaining the story, these ladies carried on conversations with in with their the, paper the, bag solitude. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what he said? Yeah. <laughs> it's, in, it's ingenious. It was the most interesting part to me of, yeah. the, of this bit. But then we head back outside. We're outside the, the kind of dorm thing again. And we hear from Shirley and Zeppelin Wong. Zeppelin Wong. It threw me off. I didn't even hear a word you said because of the name. <laughs> Their mother was there, and I guess both their parents, because they're brother and sister, uh, both their parents were would forbid Angel Island from being spoken about because it was such a horrible experience for them. It's shameful, and that's that kind of sucks. Yeah, I mean, it's cool that this that the tour that Paul does kind of shows that this was not exactly a nice place for these people. Right, and we should learn from these mistakes. Yep, because no longer is it Ingle, <laughs> Ingle, <laughs> Angel Island. Shh, no, right? oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the Phoenix coming out of the the ashes. Mm-hmm. It's uh, now Angel Island Station. Is that what he said? Yeah, I think it's what he said. So they're able to actually speak of it now in mm-hmm. its proper name. But this island would constantly be evolving. As the times changed, and the next kind of change it would have was during the Civil War. So let's hear a little bit about that. Fire front! Well, Victor, here we are in probably one of the most historic spots on this historic island. Well, this is Camp Reynolds. It was established in, in 1863 because of the public concern of for Confederate raiders coming in into the bay. And uh, behind us, we have the largest collection of wooden buildings from the Civil War period in the United States. Really? So, have you ever been to a Civil War reenactment? Yes. Whoa, really? I camped <laughs> I with <don't>... my uncle <laughs> oh, at Fort Tejon. Yes, you've told me about this. He was in the Civil War reenactment. Which uncle is this? That's my mom's twin sisters. Oh, okay. Husband. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that would have went yeah, a really he, weird way if you hadn't have stopped that sentence. So he he made me camp, like because we were he was reenacting on the Confederate side. Oh, yeah. I guess you just and, take uh, turns. Maybe? I guess I mean someone has to, right? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone wants to be on the Union side. <laughs> well, but when he, you know the outcome of the of the war, you kind of want to be on the winning side, right? That's true. Yeah, there's a – but we had to camp as if we were Confederate soldiers. Mind you, I'm nine, okay? <laughs> I'm th- This is my first introduction to camping. Not really. We've been camping before at the lake and stuff, but – First time that you probably really just, remember. And then it. I was eating what I thought was slop. <laughs> and he called it stew. 
<laughs> I mean, it was it was interesting though because you know just standing out, standing out and seeing the reenactment that was really interesting. Mm-hmm. But so these so yes the. <laughs> The area of the island that was kind of occupied by about 200 troops during the Civil War, obviously nothing ever happened. Like, there were no battles on Angel Island or even really in the Bay Area at all during the Civil War. But but this brings up an interesting history, mm-hmm. is that for as disconnected Cal- as California was from the war, I mean, we have an interesting history here people wanting to annihilate union sympathizers the bushwhackers right Mm -hmm. yep and so anyways all i'm getting at is there's an interesting civil war history in california that i think is underexplored but i mean california itself coming in as a free state yeah kind of helped there was a a battle to start the war in a way too Mm. um it's interesting i was just doing some studying for a test and it was written into the California Constitution prior to being written into the uh, U.S. Constitution that slavery would never be allowed. So California was uh, ahead of the uh, ahead of the curve on that. Yep. I mean, it's not like half the country didn't al- also al- want that at the time. It was also a hard money state. It was. So, yeah. During that period. It's funny, I noticed that you just typed in bushwhackers to try and get in, get some information. And there's no way you're going to not get I know. Uh, Luke and Butch. <laughs> WWE Hall of Famers, Luke and Butch. Oh, man. Anyway, the, uh, the Civil War part's pretty quick. I mean, there's the cannon bit. We talked to Vince, Victor Gonzalez, who's part of the Angel Island Association, and he kind of talks about how the the wooden buildings are the long or the the most wooden buildings from the Civil War in the U.S. that are still that was interesting. I, yeah, yeah. And then we see a little bit of the reenactments and kids kind of acting silly with their fanny packs on, <laughs> and then we're kind of. Jumping ahead in time. This is a very military well, a, based right. uh, <laughs> island, I guess. I was going to say, it just, the rest of the episode is just military, had the island in military history. All right. Well, from Camp Reynolds to Fort McDowell. Yeah, we are in World War II now. And this seemed like a lot more, a lot more going on than just 200 Civil War troops hanging out. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I mean, really, it wasn't. Uh, well, Dan, no, this was um, not Dan. It was a uh, Victor. Victor, yeah, Victor mm-hmm. Gonzalez. Uh, he was talking about the Union troops at Camp Reynolds. Yeah, this was Dan. Yeah, we're back with Dan. We're Sorry. back with Dan. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, we're back with Dan. Um, and he he had a quote which I think described this well. Mm-hmm. He says Fort McDowell was the chance for soldiers to go home from the war. Yes. It was a process facility for them to go to the war, the Pacific Theater specifically, so all the Indonesian islands, Japan, all that stuff. But more importantly, this is where they came home. Yeah. And he'll he it was really more of a question of preservation that kind of mm-hmm. dominated the conversation. And we get the old fashioned they're trying to keep it in arrested development. Arrested Decay. Uh, is that what they said? Oh, yeah. Arrested Decay. <laughs> Arrested Development <laughs> is a, a TV show. That was, that was a slip. <laughs> Love the show. Yeah. It, yeah. It's it's kind of hard to believe how big these buildings are. And old Dan... Dave? Dan. He uh, He's talking about how it's going to cost millions to restore these things. And, oh, yeah. These are giant buildings here. Because there were 8,000 men on the island at any given time, like either coming or going. And again, this my, uh, this uh, island is only a mile square. So that's a lot of fools. Yeah. It's like uh, the density of San Francisco. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> um, but there's a, a picture that they flash up on the screen of this big kind of banner that they... It looks like they made it out of 
painted white rocks that they put on the hill. Yeah. Saying, welcome back. Well done. And I can't even, like, I, I'm i super, never been in the military, obviously. <laughs> Not that you can kind of be in, unless you're Randy Orton. Um, but I can't even imagine, like, how cool that would be to be like, okay, I fought in, fought in the war. I'm going home. And finally, you're just like, oh, shoot, there it is. That is cool. Probably not the same feeling coming back from Vietnam. Definitely not. And so, yeah. Anyway, we're we're, get, we're actually skipping that war in our uh, true. Angel Island war history extravaganza. Well, come to think about it, Huell was kind of in the military. Yeah, I would say, I don't want to say that reservists are kind of in the military. No, but I mean... It's the same risk they run at any given time. It's very true. They could be summoned in at any time. Uh But he's probably never felt that coming back from from battle. I don't know. No, because, yeah. I I don't really know what years he was in the military. That's kind of... It's always been hard to pin down. Yeah, huh. Because I know he went to college, but I don't know if he went pre or post college. I see. And, like... He doesn't talk about it. Throughout the show, we see Huell downplays his military uh, experience. Except I don't he know was why. wearing that Top Gun jacket to get You're on right. the plane. That was the only time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But after this, uh, Ranger Dan takes us to these missile silos. Which we come to learn here that Huell is not a communist sympathizer. No. Because he uses the uh, he uses the phrase, these were used. These Nike missiles were used to guard us against the communist threat. Yeah, <laughs> Huel's so, American through and through. He is. Yeah, he's not letting those uh, those communists come and wreck. Well, he this. was pretty friendly with the USSR. Uh, That's true. Yeah, he's uh, he's a equal opportunity guy. Yeah. Like, he does not discriminate. But it is interesting seeing this kind of like overgrown. It's, it looks like a big parking lot with these big bay doors that open up from underneath. But Huel talks about how fascinating it is to see all this stuff kind of like rusting away. And having been to the Chapman uh, like little museum thing that they have for Huel, they also have his whole art collection, which you think like, oh, what kind of art would Huel collect? Well, it's kind of stuff like this, this like industrial scrap stuff. He would go and find like an old, big old rusted piece of iron that had decades of different paint colors scraped off of it. And that's, he would hang that on his wall Hmm. and large industrial waste things like a, like a large, you know, you know, those uh, big wooden spools that um, like wire comes on. Yeah. We used to have them. Yeah. Yeah, at least he's in our backyard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he had something like that, but it was uh, made of metal, I think. Okay. Um, so this seems like the first glimpse into him kind of getting into that. But then the bee. Did you? He's so into the bee. Okay. The, it's cool because it is like this hand drawn or hand painted picture of a bee because it was the bee squad that was here with these missiles. But. He said the bee had a tail. (laughs) Because it's a drawing of a bee, and it's got a missile coming out of its its butt, which usually, you know, a bee, which Dan corrects him, has a stinger, not a tail. Huel doesn't even flinch. Doesn't even care. This reminded me of a story. One of my friends told me this story. He does not listen to the show, so I'm going to say it's my friend. I'm rewriting history. Uh, my coworker, I can't do it. It's too weird. <laughs> His coworker um, was uh, an interesting lady, I guess, is a way to put it. She was talking about having been bitten by a bee. Oh, man, I got bit by a bee. <laughs> he will just remind me of that, like, re- uh Redoing the anatomy of a bee. <laughs> you get stung by a bee. Bite stinger, not its tail. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's <laughs> it's funny. Huel's into it, though. He is, yeah. You know, they before they go mm-hmm. up to Mount Livermore, yeah. 
there is something that Dan said, which I thought was interesting. Mm-hmm. He said, you know, this island never saw any combat, right? Yeah. And he said, there's never been a shot fired on the island in anger. <laughs> said, what? <laughs> there have been lots of happy shots. I'm guessing he meant like, like lots of target practice. Yeah, no, yeah it's just funny. It's like, no one ever got mad. How does he like... What if someone was just jealous? Right? <laughs> Or, like, while they're doing target practice, they're, like, really mad at their bunkmate. And they're like, I'm oh. pretending this is Billy. I hope that those soldiers weren't doing that. That seems kind of gnarly. But uh, that was. But as they're up on the mountain, they do have, like, one of the coolest views of the whole bay. Yeah, for sure. And then they talk about how people don't really come over there. Like, a million people go to Alcatraz, and only 200,000 go to Angel Island to visit. Yeah, and I think Dan hit the nail on the head. Mm-hmm. Is and he kind of said it in passing, but he's like, "Oh, well, maybe we should make a few movies about this place." <laughs> it's like, well, maybe, but you might need Sean Connery yeah, to be exactly. in some of these movies. <laughs> so, but yeah, um, I, this makes me want to go. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, Dan did say that people usually spend six hours there. That's a bit long. I'll go for two. Yeah, I mean that says something. You mm-hmm. could, you can uh, people spend an average of six hours instead. What? Yeah, Alcatraz was two. He two said hours. one, one oh, to two, one to two. So I did, I was wondering. They spent two days on this island. Mm-hmm. Did he sleep in the rangers' quarters? I bet he didn't sleep on the island. There's no way, right? I don't know. <sighs> I want to know where he stayed for sure. But you think he slept on one of the bunks? Oh, in the in the quarantine zone. Yep. I don't know. I hope not. That's weird <laughs> to think of him just hanging out with Louie in there. But well, if we get the dinner with Louie, we'll, we'll, we'll be one of the him. questions. Yeah. yeah. Well, apart from the military history and the nice view and the island, well, as the West Coast Ellis Island. Yeah. That's about it. That's it. And we end this episode where we started on the ferry. And Huell is doing his like walk and talk outro a little routine that he does and i wish they had done it slower because it's just a a cornucopia of 90s clothes and you can't really get tight in on anything but man look at the end of that shot he ends at the end of the boat american flag waving (laughs) gosh louis and huel were masters of this but this isn't the absolute end huel waves goodbye and then we get some nice aerial shots of the island from a helicopter that I'm sure was the same helicopter we were in last Hell week. Hell USA. You got it. I can just imagine that Louis is up there. He's like, hey, buddy, uh, we're doing another show next week. Uh, Why don't you go ahead yeah. and uh, cut a nice left over here? <laughs> Speaking of, I just said next week, but I learned something new. What's that? So we know we've talked about the... Golden State of Mind documentary that um, AAA put out a couple years back. A lot of that footage of interviewing Huell about his own life was pulled from a Viewfinder episode, which was a show, it was like a documentary style show from one of the other PBS affiliates that they did about Huell while he was still alive. That's how we know that he lived at the El Royale Apartments in LA because he Mm. talks about it. Also, during that part, he kind of gives some little tidbits about the show's early uh, days, like how they viewed it was going to go, and other little bits of information. One being that this show aired once a month back then, which makes sense. I mean, there's like 12 episodes per season at this point. Yeah, yeah. So we've been saying weekly, weekly, whatever, but no, this was a once a month thing. Okay. Yeah, Yeah, this was a... Yeah, and it kind of made me rethink... Maybe they really were just doing these episodes one at a time. Like obviously this one had to have been the same pair of days. Right. But all the other ones, if they're having a month in between, that's plenty of time. Are to... you proposing that we do our podcast once a month? Bro. <laughs> Take sixty years to do it? <laughs> no. We'll uh we'll speed through these. Yeah. The other thing he said was that the original kind of idea for the show was that it would start in 1990 and end in the year 2000, chronicling the last decade of the 20th century. 
That was the concept of the show. At this point in the documentary that I watched, I think it was like 2010. And he's like, obviously that's long gone. So we've added the first decade of the 21st century. (laughs) But it's an interesting little thing. Uh, It's also on Chapman. I forget exactly what the title is. I think it's just called Huel Viewfinder. But it's... It's the only time that Huell really sits and talks, well, he stands and talks about his own self, like his own uh, life story. Yeah, Viewfinder, California's Dreamer. It's actually billed on on Chapman's website as California's Gold Episode 999, which isn't really a thing, I don't think. But Mm -mm. either way, it's on there. And that's really wrapping it up now, right? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so where are we going next week? Well, we're keeping the war theme going. Yeah, no kidding. It's an episode on World War II, and we're heading down to Long Beach and then Santa Barbara County. Yeah. So Huel obviously had a uh, agenda on this this little run of episodes, mm-hmm. these monthly episodes of California's Gold. <laughs> But we don't have any agenda. We're just here to have fun, watch Huel be silly, and learn along the way. Mm-hmm. So we hope that you come along with us next week and every week as we continue our search for Huel.